Okay. We're almost there. Great. Okay. Welcome in, everybody, and thank you so much for being with us tonight. Thank you to Robert Lyman, who is all the way in England right now, and I think we're hitting about midnight over there. So thank you so much for taking the time to be with us. Um, so we're so glad to be hosting Robert Lyman and Dr. Culver today as we celebrate Robert's release of War of Empires. We're grateful for the turnout today, and we just thank everybody for adapting to the virtual setting, and we hope you're all staying safe during this time. Before I introduce our guests any further, please note that we will allow some time at the end of the discussion for questions. You can submit a question for Robert or Dr. Culver at any time during the event using the QA feature. If you're interested in purchasing a book, you can do so online at midtownreader.com, over the phone, or stopping by our store in person. With that being said, it is my pleasure to introduce today's guests, Robert Lyman and Dr. Culver. Um, Robert Lyman is regarded as one of Britain's most talented military historians with 15 best-selling works of history published in numerous television appearances, including the BBC's Who Do You Think You Are? and on two episodes of the Great Escapes documentary series. He has spent 20 years in the British Army and is an elected fellow of the Royal Historical Society, is a frequent traveler to the US, Asia, and Austral Asia, and he currently lives in England. Dr. Culver, PhD, is an associate professor of East Asian history at Florida State University, where she specializes in modern Japan and Northeast Asia related topics, including teaching one of the nation's only courses on North Korean history. She has received her doctorate from the University of Chicago and holds an AM degree in regional studies East Asia from Harvard University with a history degree from Vassar College. Since 2012, Dr. Culver has served as a scholar in the US-Japan Network for the Future, which connects academics to foreign policy community. We are here to discuss Robert's newest release of War of Empires. Here's just a brief synopsis of the book. Um, in 1941 and 1942, the British and Indian armies were brutally defeated and Japan reigned supreme in its newly conquered territories throughout Asia. But change was coming. New commanders were appointed, significant training together with restructuring took place and new tactics were developed. A War of Empires by acclaimed historian Robert Lyman expertly retells these coordinated efforts and describes how a new volunteer Indian army rising from the ashes of, of defeat would ferociously fight to turn the tide of war. I will now pass it over to Robert and Dr. Culver. Well, thank you very much for that introduction. Um, Dr. Culver, do you want to start by um, introducing the, the subject and asking some questions, or would you like me to throw myself in the deep end? Yeah, um, I was just absolutely amazed at um, the critical acclaim for your books, and um, you keep on writing these amazing, compelling bestsellers. Now, um, what is it about, in particular, narrative history that appeals to general readers and um, for, uh, as a historian, um, what are some of your tricks of the trade to um, just enliven this? I mean, it's very well written. I mean, I, it's almost dramatic. I mean, it's almost like you're there. Um, was that uh, in any way related to your own military experience? Uh, you have two decades uh, in the mm. British military. Was that also what you drew upon when writing? It's a great question. And I think the truth is, it, yes, it, it certainly influenced the way I think and the way I write. Um, I think I like to write history uh, as I like to read it. So I like interesting, exciting, challenging history. And uh, to, to answer your first question, Annika, I think um, I, I've, been sub I've been studying the subject of the war in the Far East. Uh, so let me just be really clear for uh, American listeners. When we think about the war against Japan, the, the, the Allies divided into th two theatres, a Pacific theatre and a, uh, a Far Eastern theatre, as the British called it, the Americans called it, the China, Burma, India theatre. So CBI, Far East, they're one and the same thing. It's all about Burma, because Burma was the route by which American Lend-Lease supplies were able to reach China. Uh, I have been studying the subject for 30 years, and I've done uh, an enormous amount of traveling and, and talking to people about it. My views have changed over the years, but I like to write history um, that challenges preconceptions. 
I started off by doing, but yeah, we all we all inherit ideas and arguments and theories and things because we taught them and we brought them, we're, we're brought up and with them in our families and our communities and our churches and so on. And over the years, I had just imbibed all these ideas about the war in the Far East and about who fought it and why and what the strategic implications were. And I sat down three or four years ago and I said, I'm going to start again. I'm going to have another good long look at the war. And I'm going to ask some really deep questions about uh, and, and really challenge myself and challenge some of my preconceptions. And um, it's quite amazing what happened. I didn't really think that I would come across anything dramatic, but I, I think I've come up. I've come across a number of things of revived ideas that um, had lain dormant, certainly in popular view about the war in the Far East. And, and that's been exciting. It's, um, you asked about why it was sort of, you know, how, to, how I write. Well, I, I start by just laying out the bare bones of the facts. And then I always ask the question, I was taught many, many years ago, 40 years ago at school, to ask, so what? So what? You know, who made the decision? Why did they make it? What were all the issues associated with bringing it together? And it's quite interesting, actually, when you do that in history uh, to see what you find, because history is not binary. History is made by people like us who can be up one down and down the next day, who can hold dualities of views. I mean, we are all very complex creatures. We could be liberal economically and not liberal socially and vice versa. And we can have lots and lots of different views. And I think that's the best way of looking at history. Look, look at history in terms of who made the decision, why did they make it? Were they aware of the consequence or the implications of the decision? And more often than not, no, because people make decisions because they think it's the right one, but they can't see, they can't see into the future. That's the one benefit historians have got. We can say, ooh, you know, if only they'd done something else, we wouldn't have ended up in that terrible situation. So um, it's a long-winded way of answering your question, which is the stories that I write, the histories that I write are about people. And it's about the complexity, complexities of people and their fears and their aspirations and their concerns and their decisions and so on. And at the root of this great drama that was the Second World War are those conflicts of fears and ambitions and egos and so on, not least of all in Japan itself, and you know that uh, better than anyone else here tonight. I've studied Japan for, for many years and I've studied the, 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 the march to war, um, and it's a frightening tale of um, confusions and ignorance and um, pretensions and prejudice and a whole series of steps that people created to justify a view about statehood and about self. And that's what, what, I, what I don't ever want to do and I try not to do is just write facts or my view of facts or describe what happened and who made the decision and so on because that's that's pretty tedious I didn't like reading that sort of stuff I like to be able to read stuff that's exciting and interesting and dramatic and it's full of the personal stuff and um so there we are I've, uh, it's a it's a long-winded way of trying to answer the question it's I, I like writing books that I like reading Yeah, that's, that makes sense. Uh, that's actually very, very inspiring because um, unfortunately, um, at least in the United States, a lot of the books about history are now written by journalists. And so general audiences pick up books written by journalists as opposed to we historians, because sometimes we're just thinking of other academic audiences. And I think you do a great job of the narrative of uh, oh, providing yes. voices people. And um, I wanted to ask you also, um, you really uh, focus on the British Indian Army and the role of um, these individuals in turning the tide of war. Um, and um, I was wondering what got you into that topic? And do you agree that um, this was very important also in um, aiding the Americans, right, in their fight in the Pacific by kind of detracting from attention, right, that they could have brought to yeah. the fight yeah. in the campaign? Oh, uh, well, great series of questions. So let me try and answer the one by one. First is, yes, I have noticed that in America in particular, 
Uh, there's some, been some fantastic um, histories written, but they are written by journalists, which is an interesting thing because journalists are very good at telling stories. And historians like me, academics like me, we often just gaze inwardly. We have, we have internal conversations within our uh, teaching fraternities and so on. Uh, they're, they're not good. I mean, that's, it's a real challenge. But I would say that there are, it's a very, it's a great challenge for the academic community, but there are brilliant historians, certainly in the UK, who uh, teach full time at university and, and who also write uh, fabulous uh, narrative history. And um, so the discipline is alive and well, certainly over here. And, um, and I think that the real challenge is, as, a, as an academic historian, I've felt this over the years, my first books were really quite academic, and I was focusing on making an argument and winning over my uh, academic colleagues. I, I, I'm still rigorously and ruthlessly analytical, and um, I use all the tools I've been taught and all the tools that are really important for historians. What happened? What's the evidence for it? pull it all together, yes, come to a judgment, but tell it in an interesting way. That's the key thing, because otherwise history is going to be um, left to um, academics and, dare I say it, our ivory towers, and they are, it's, not, it's not going to be accessible to the everyday reader. I, I want to be able to have an agent. Many, many years ago, he said to me, Rob, you know, you want, we have a phrase in England about the man in the, clop, the Clapham omnibus the ordinary person on the street. What is going to interest them about your story? Um, so that's the first and most important thing. The second thing is that I've never been interested in war as an exercise in military activity because, and I hate describing myself, I try not to describe myself as a military historian. I'm a historian. Um, I would never set out to teach or study um, warfare, I suppose it was my time in the army that um, gave me that predilection. But I'm a social historian. I write about people. That's the most important thing. And I like writing about um, decisions that people make. And I like writing about the context in which they made them. And that leads on to the third point, which you raise about the Indian army, because it's, although I have been studying, I first taught a course on the war in the Far East in 1991, so it's 30 years ago, but really it's only been in the last 10 years, perhaps from 2011 or 12, that I fully understood the nature of the Indian dimension to the war. Um, so I'll just, just clear up a few things here. First of all, um, the war in the Far East, so the war around Burma was incredibly strategically important to the allies because, um, and the Americans were incredibly clear about this in a way that the British weren't in 1940-41. Um, this was an American obsession with supporting Chiang Kai-shek, so the Cantonese army, the Kuomintang, um, holding the Japanese, the Imperial Japanese army in China. And um, if the Chinese were able to um, keep large numbers of Japanese troops at bay in, in China, those Japanese troops, maybe, I mean, the, 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 the it's very difficult to actually determine the numbers. I, I, um, Francis Pike's produced a brilliant book in the last year, and he argues that there are probably a million Japanese in China by 1940. And I think that's probably about right. It might be just a bit exaggerated, but a large number of men. Okay, and if those Japanese troops had been available to fight the Americans and the, the British and the Pacific and the Far East, I mean, it would have turned the tide completely. So it's really important for Roosevelt and for Washington to persuade Churchill to support China. So that's the most important thing. I mean, at the, the heart of the entire war in the Far East, this war of empires I describe, is the importance of sustaining China. There was, um, there were concerns during the war that the British were only concerned about reinvading Burma to save their empire. Well, I have to say, I'm very pleased to say there's absolutely no evidence for it. It was, a, it was a, quite an amusing, a, a snide against the, the British and their empire in the 1940s. Um, and the counter snide from Britain was that, well, America's empire, America's empire is no less significant and is growing, uh, not, not perhaps territorially, but certainly financially and culturally. Uh, but that's another matter. But I think the point here is that um, China was incredibly important. And the more I got into studying the story, and just leaving Japan to, uh, to one side for a moment, 
uh, I realized how important India was to this. Mm. Unfortunately, if you have a superficial view of the war, you, you think, and everyone talks about the British Indian Army, and they, everyone talks about the Burma campaign being a British campaign. Well, let me tell you, there was no such thing as the Burma, the British Indian Army. It didn't exist. There was a British Army, and there was an Indian Army, and the Indian Army was the legally constituted army of the government of India. Um, India had its own independent government. Now, it was a point that its governor, the, uh, the uh, viceroy, was appointed by London. Yes, colonialism was a thing. But actually, India is a very, very important story. And the story of India under British rule is one of nuance. It's one of India coming together as a state from a as a single entity from a whole variety of separate states and growing together over the years since the mutiny in 1858 uh, under the, the tutelage of London. Uh, and we won't get into that subject at the moment, but actually it's important, you know, when I interview Indian veterans of the war, there aren't many left now, but I've, I've done a lot of this over the years, I have never once come across any of them that says they were joining an army run by Britain. They weren't, they were joining the Indian Army. I remember one very, very uh, important interview I conducted in uh, 1999, I think it was, with a man who was to become a hurricane pilot in the Indian Air Force in 1941, 42. And I said, why did you join the, the British forces? And he looked at me as though I had two heads. And I didn't really understand why he, there was a long silence. He said, Rob, you need to understand I didn't even think about the government. I didn't think about the British. I'd never seen an Englishman before, but I knew all about Japan and I knew all about Nan Nanking, 1937. It, our newspapers were full of it, he said. And when I heard the Japanese were on our doorstep, I joined the Indian Air Force. The first thing I, and he, he said, all my friends did as well. We all wanted to join up. Why? Because we wanted to defend India. Now, this is the first time I'd really thought about this because we in the West, certainly in academia, we have this sort of idea that, you know, we have to see everything through the lens of our current um, political makeup. And of course, our, our, and it's, it's fair enough, it's reasonable. We, we look at um, colonial India through a colonial prism. We've got to get rid of that and we've got to go back and we've got to sit down there as though it was 1941 and ask ourselves the questions, well, why am I doing things? Will I do things because I'm oppressed because I'm a slave of Britain or will I do do I have the agency to do things for other reasons and I think the thing that's really struck me over the years is that Indians joined the Indian Army and the Indian Air Force and the Indian Navy from 1942 onwards to defend India they weren't joining the British Army they were joining the Indian Army and they were doing it not to protect the past not to defend colonialism. They were all nationalists. They wanted an independent India, but they recognized the threat from Japan. And I think this is the big thing that um, I really want to get across in the book, that Indians were fighting for India. They were fighting for their future. They were fighting for their families. They were fighting for the future they could make themselves. And that's actually why I'm quite excited about this, because it wasn't about a, a mercenary army or a colonial army fighting the Japanese in India. It was, it was about Indians rising up to fight militarism for the right reasons. Now, isn't that exciting? And I think, you know, one of the things that has struck me, I've said this in India many times, is that India, you've got to grasp this history. This is really important history for you. This is a history of Indian standing up for freedom. Yes, standing up for democracy, a democracy they didn't fully have, but they were fighting for it. There are, there are many accounts. I mean, the, the standard Nehru argument at the time is, why are we fighting against the Japanese for freedoms that we don't fully have? Well, they were fighting for them because in exercising their ability to fight against the Japanese, they were claiming those rights for themselves. And, and that's, that's a beautiful example of real agency from people right across India. The other really important thing to say about this is that um, prior to the start of the Second World War, the Indian Army wasn't an Indian Army. It, it was recruited by the British from a small number of what were called martial races, so the men who were most loyal to Britain, and the army was largely a, a gendarmerie, a police force, uh, and in 1938 39 it was changed a little bit to be able to support British forces elsewhere in the empire. Uh, 
But by 1943, that had completely changed. All of a sudden, because of the, uh, the dramatic uh, uh, effect of the Japanese invasion of the Far East, um, the army needed to increase in size and soldiers were, take, were recruited from right across India. Now, one of the really amazing, well, there are a couple of amazing things about this. The first is that two and a half million Indians volunteered to join the army, Navy and Air Force, mainly the army, um, in the Second World War, most of them after 1942. Now, why is that important? Well, of course, in February 1942, of course, we had the collapse of Malaya and the fall of Singapore. So this seemed to be the high point of British colonial failure in Asia. Well, if that's true, why did nearly two million men suddenly, or over a process of about a year and a half, join the Indian Army? And they, there was the other really interesting thing is there was not a recruitment campaign. Mm. You would expect that there would have been lots of people wandering around India, banging the drum and saying the Japanese are at our front door. We need you to join the army. That did not happen. There was a there, there were advertisements in newspapers and there were some very famous posters that went out. But if you look at the records and they're very very clear, large numbers of uh, educated Indians, not impoverished Indians looking for jobs, lots of Indians with good jobs from good families, from farming families in particular, and from the cities, queued up for weeks to get into the Indian Army. And I think we just need to understand this, I mean, and, and, and appreciate the agency that individual Indians had uh, in a way that I don't think we have, actually. I think that over the years, since the end of the war, we have completely forgotten this. Uh, and it's a really, really powerful story. The, the, those two and a half million men and women um, constituted the largest volunteer army in the history of mankind. Every other army of equivalent size has not been volunteered. They've all been dragooned into it. In Britain, we, <laughs> we had to um, dragoon men into the army. You know, they were conscripted because we were running out of manpower in 1943. Uh, but not so in India. And it's really quite an extraordinary story. Uh, and the, every, I have to say, I've never come across anyone, uh, any veteran rather in India, who said they joined up because they were forced to, or because uh, they were hungry, or because their parents told them to. Now that was the case in other parts of the empire, it was the case in parts of Africa, for instance, there were recruiting tribes that were sent around villages and and, and the tribal chiefs were, and particularly in East and West Africa, were given quotas of of men to recruit, not in India. It was quite quite unique in India. And I think this is really important, looking back, I, I'm, I'm banging on, I just make this point that, wasn't that a wonderful expression of Indian unity? Wasn't that an expression of Indian saying, we recognize there's a problem here. We're, we're gonna ignore the politics and the polity of our, of our um, government, but we are going to stand up and defend India from Japanese militarism, which they feared dramatically, left and right, nationalists. I mean, in fact, um, General Claude Auchinleck, who was the commander in chief in 1943, said famously, I expect every Indian officer to be a nationalist. <laughs> you know, this is really important. I want you to be desperately concerned about your future and protecting India and being an Indian and wanting an Indian future. Now this colonialism stuff, you know, it's always transitory. We're not here for the, for the long term and we don't want to be here for the long term. This India is yours. And here we have this wonderful expression of Indianness stepping out and saying, we are going to uh, fight the Japanese and we're gonna win. 90% of the fabulous 14th army that defeated the Japanese in India in 1944, Japanese invaded India, and they were defeated at these great battles at Imphal and Kima, mm -hmm. and again in Burma in 1945, were Indian, not British. I mean, that's the that's a really key thing. Absolutely fascinating. And um, it's, it's surprising that um, there hasn't been more written about that topic, which I think it's it's excellent that that's been brought to light. Um, I want to hear a little bit more about the Burmese Independence Army. Mm. And um, again, Burma is also not much featured uh, by mm. historians in terms of World War II. Um, and um, so why were the Japanese unsuccessful ultimately in Burma? Well, the, the, I think I've I've written somewhere that uh, 
The Japanese uh, invasion of uh, Southeast Asia in 1941, early 1942, was incredibly well planned. And a lot of ink was spilled in Tokyo in preparing plans for the invasion of, the, of Southeast Asia, Pearl Harbor, and so on. But not a single drop of ink was dropped. And not, not a single, yeah, not a single drop of ink was, was spent on thinking about or writing about what would happen afterwards. And the problem is the justification for war. Right. So there were there were two levels of justification for war. There was a justification uh, internally in Japan and in, in, in the political arena for the war, which was to secure essential resources to, to keep on fueling the army in China. There is this lie that goes around that says, well, the Japanese are running out of coal and rubber and rice and, and oil and bauxite and tungsten, and they needed to be able to secure these resources for Japan. No, no, no. They were expending these resources in enormous quantities in an egregious war in China. That's why they needed these resources. If they hadn't been so imperially aggressive in China, uh, those challenges would not have arisen. So, but they, they, so that's the first level. At the, at the higher level, in order to be able to persuade the people of Southeast Asia that the war was in their interest, they called it a, a war of Asia for the Asiatics, where Japan would create a co-prosperity sphere for everyone. The problem is that was simply rhetoric. And within a few days of countries being taken over um, and the combat troops leaving, that became very, very evident to, uh, to, to subject peoples. And the real tragedy in Southeast Asia is the enormous numbers of people, uh, native people, ordinary people caught up in this war who had nothing to do with it, who died as a consequence of uh, Japanese perfidy. I'm, I'm afraid it's really as simple as that. Um, if, you, if you boil everything back, uh, and, and I know that you've written on this and, and you're an expert on it, Annika, it's very interesting to have this conversation with you, to, to, to look at the way in which Japanese society in the 1920s and 30s created this myth of militarism. They created the myth that there was, there was virtue in military action. Military action itself could create greatness, and it was important in creating greatness within a state and, 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 and a sense of nationhood. And we know that's a lie. That, that's a complete lie, and it just leads to death and death in huge quantities of pe innocent people. The real tragedy in the South and Southeast Asia is that the Japanese had no plan, uh, no political plan at all for uh, the countries they overran. So they got rid of um, Britain in Malaya and Singapore and Burma. They got rid of the Dutch and the East Indies, and they got rid of uh, America and the Philippines uh, and the British and Hong Kong as well. But there was nothing to replace it. There was no political organization or structure or purpose or design or desire of any kind. There were no politicians, no or civil servants came in the wake of the, of the military vanguard. And that's always the first test to see whether there's any substance to the rhetoric. And, and, and you asked about the Burma Independence Army. The Burma Independence Army um, was a very, very interesting organization. There is no doubt that there was a, a, a growing and energetic and a very interesting independence movement in Burma in the 1930s, really began about 1935, 36, although there was evidence of its initial growth in the 1920s. It didn't really start until the 1920s. Um, and this was given purpose by the Japanese. The Japanese persuaded them, uh, uh, persuaded a number of uh, Burmese um, nationalists to throw in their lot with them. The most prominent, of course, was Aung San, the father of Aung San Suu Kyi, the current um, imprisoned leader of the opposition movement in Myanmar. Now, Aung San was a very interesting character. I've got a huge amount of time for Aung San. He, he really um, wanted um, a free Burma. And he was searching through the 1930s for a way in which he could achieve this against um, the British colonial uh, um, government. And, um, you know, the, the, the point about British colonialism was that it was procedural, it was bureaucratic. So in order to be able to persuade Britain to give up on Burma, gosh, it was going to take a lifetime of arguing in the courts and going to London and 
creating opposition. He thought, I don't have time for this. I, I want to be able to achieve an independent Burma in another way. And he, he didn't resort to violence, you know, extreme violence. He resorted to civil disobedience, which is a different thing. But of course, the war changed everything. And the Japanese gave him the opportunity. He was always very suspicious of the Japanese. He was courted by the Japanese. But I need to add here, Aung San actually wasn't courted by the Japanese. He was courted by one Japanese, a very interesting guy called Colonel Keiji Suzuki, who was very, very passionate about uh, Japan's redeeming mission in the Far East. But he was a man alone. And he wasn't supported by Tokyo and he wasn't supported by the military high command to the extent that when um, the BIA, the Burma Independence Army, with Aung San at its head, was formed in uh, December 1941 in Thailand, it eventually grew to about three and a half thousand men. By the time the Japanese invaded Burma in January 1942, it had three and a half thousand supporters, most of whom were um, Thai born Burmese. Um, people of Burmese extraction, very few actually from Burma itself. They invaded with the Japanese and um, unfortunately the, the Burma Independence Army really blotted its copy book immediately because again it didn't have a plan and it's worth just saying very briefly here, Burma, wow, it's very difficult to call an organization the Burma Independence Army when really there's no such thing as Burma. Because Burma is a mosaic of at least, and I'm talking about now as well as then, of at least 29 ethnicities, all of whom claim their own independence. So the, I think the important thing, if, if people aren't au fait with um, Burma's polity and ethnicity, is just to realize that the perhaps the majority, just about the majority population in Burma is Bema, or the people of the plains, the original Buddhist Burmans who live in the in the Irrawaddy Delta. Um, they're the Burmans. And uh, this is the real problem with the Burmese independence, oh, the Burma independence army. It was a Baymar independence army. It didn't include anyone from the, the, the hill tribes who were traditionally antagonistic to the Baymars. had never really been part of the Burma, Burma empire, the Kobang empire. And uh, certainly all they wanted was independence. They didn't want to, they didn't want unity with uh, the Baymars. So we're talking about the Karens, the Shans, very, very significant Shan tribe, um, uh, are very different to the Burmans and never part of the Burmese empire, the Cations, the Nagas, the Chins, and the Arakanese, and the Mons as well, and Tanasarum. So, I mean, you have this amazing mosaic, and unfortunately these nationalists, lovely, I mean, I've got such a lot of time for them. I really, I think they're wonderful people, and I've got a lot of time for Aung Sang, but actually they were very naive. You know, he, he made this claim in the Burma Independence Army that this was an army for all Burma, and yet it was staffed almost with one exception by Baymars. And there wasn't enough recognition of the intrinsic you know, ethnic mosaic that would have to be untangled and, and sorted out. But the one thing I like about Aung San is that he really was a pragmatist. He, he, he called himself a socialist. He helped set up the... Um, the Burma Communist Party, the BCP, but he was never a communist. He, he wanted to be able to gain the support of the communists in China. Uh, he was attracted, as most people are at some stage in their lives, to some of the tenets of Marxism, but never as a political ideology to impose on Burma. He just wanted to find the way. What is the way in which I can achieve independence for, for Britain? Um, are you, and you know, that, that's his, his, his whole story, the whole story of... Um, Aung San, actually told very well by Aung San Suu Kyi, and she wrote a very, very good biography of her father, very short biography, you'll read it in a couple of hours, in about 1991 or something like that, uh, and she makes this very clear that he was, you know, ultimately a pragmatist, ult ultimately a, a Burman who wanted independence, and he was just trying to find the way to get to this political uh, nirvana, that's a bit unfair, it's not a Nevada, but a political um, place where all Burmans could coalesce around this, this, um, this new freedom for be, of being Burman. It's a very interesting story, but the, the BIA was insignificant militarily. The, the Japanese used them and dropped them. So by July 1941, so the British had been thrown out of Burma by May. Um, by July 
1942, Suzuki had been sent back to Japan. He wasn't allowed to stay in Burma. Keiji Suzuki was, was persona non grata because he was encouraging these Burmans to think the Japanese would give them more than um, they ever would. And um, they got rid of the BIA and the Japanese created the Burma Defense Army, the BDA. Aung San was made the commander in chief as a full colonel of the BDA. But the story of the BDA is really over the next year until Burma was given its um, pretend independence. In August 1943, the Japanese tried to squash it and separate the troops and not let them train together and, you know, take the, you know, spike their guns. It, it, it was that the, the Japanese were not prepared to allow Burma to uh, exercise any political control of its destiny. And, you know, uh, and that's a real problem, but that's, that's the reason for the failure of Japan. They had no agenda to give power really to the, um, to the Burmans and to anyone else. But, and Aung San says this, he said, he, he says, and I can't remember the exact words, but he said something like, you know, the, the, the British starved us. He's using this, this figure of speech, but the Japanese squeezed the life out of us. You know, it's, there, are, there are degrees of oppression and the, the British were nothing compared to the Japanese. Um, and, you know, that's not excusing it. There's not, there's not water battery here. It's just a fact he realized actually the Japanese were never interested in allowing uh, the, the Burmans to have a real free expression politically and um, have their own country. Yeah, it's it's fascinating that you talk about this. It's almost uh, well, I mean, uh, who's a diplomatic historian, saying if they had only been satisfied with Manchukuo, and there was not the war with China, they would have still maintained Manchukuo, because ideologically they were much more adept at creating this so-called new state, but even so, there were only 13 nations that actually saw it as a legitimate entity, right? And so yeah. even there, it, it was not very successful, right? The harmony of the five races, um, the paradise of the kingly way, um, all of these yeah. things which they wanted to later import, but um, as you're saying, uh, when they go to Singapore, which they renamed Shonan, um, and other areas, um, were very unsuccessful in creating these multi-ethnic, multi-racial spheres, but ultimately they were in a purely colonizing position where they extracted the resources and used it to fight in China. And I think the concept of imperial overextension was really their, their doom. Yeah. Yeah, no, that, that's completely right. I mean, the very interesting thing about the Japanese in the war, and, 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 and I sort of write about this, um, uh, not in detail, but I, I, I allude to it, that this idea that, you know, J Japan has sort of created this idea of itself and was trying to impose its sense of empire practically uh, on the rest of the, the Pacific. Without having a without having a unity of purpose, and you you talk about this. One of the problems, of course, is that when they get to Singapore and indeed in Burma, who's in charge? Well, it's the army's in charge. Well, if you just go back a little bit, the navy's in charge of this plan to subjugate the Pacific, not the army, because the army's in China, and there's this big battle in in Japan between uh, the navy and the army for power. And I, I didn't mention this earlier, but I think you know your your listeners or all the listeners tonight, um, you just need to remember that at the heart of most human antagonism is this struggle for power. It's power, it's ideological power, it's physical power, it's practical power, it's material power. The heart of all human evil is this desire for power. And you know, so what we must get away from is this idea that Japan was a completely unified bloc and, and completely unified in its purpose and intentions and direction and instructions, and they knew what they were doing because that simply wasn't the case. And the example of Keiji Suzuki is a really, really good example. I mean, he was a man who was passionate about persuading the Japanese. He was too junior, he's only a colonel, uh, but he was passionate about persuading the Japanese high command to give independence to Burma, which would never ever be accepted 
and, and he did, his career didn't last long. Um, what, one of the things I do talk about in the book is this remarkable ability of the Japanese high command, military high command, to make egregious strategic decisions. I mean, they, you know, it's, it's quite extraordinary for a, for a great country like Japan to make as many mistakes as they did in the Second World War. Their biggest mistake, of course, was charging into the Far East and, and attacking Pearl Harbor. I talk about that a lot. I've written a lot about Pearl Harbor, and I'm giving a series of podcasts next week on Pearl Harbor, um, without actually understanding the reaction that this attack would have on popular opinion in the United States, because they, Japanese, lit the touch paper of popular antagonism, racial antagonism to the Japanese. That hatred of the Japanese that we all saw in the war and which took a long, long time for my parents' generation to, uh, to dissipate, began with Japanese aggrandizement. Now, there's a, there, are, there are some arguments, and, and I accept some of them, about the way in which um, America and Britain could and should have behaved you know, more intelligently towards the Japanese in the 1930s. But we also need to remember that at the heart of Japanese polity in the 1930s was uh, an increasingly aggressive militarism. So what we have in Japan is very, very similar to what Germany was trying and catching up to do uh, in, um, in Eastern Europe, which was seizing land and territory to be, to be able to create what, they, what Hitler described as Greece Deutschland, as greater Germany, um, in which its borders were defined by German blood. Well, the, the Japan, as you well know, the Japanese idea was very, very similar. And in order to be able to create this, uh, this sense of Japanese self, they created a whole series of cultural icons and, uh, and attributes and, um, you know, brand new. I mean, this whole idea of Bushido is actually very, very new. I mean, it was an incredibly powerful emotive force in the Japanese army in the Second World War, but it was relatively new. I mean, the rules for... I mean, it was it was all post the Meiji Restoration in in, in 1867, you know, but uh, this this culture that Jap Japan had built and was now forcing on the rest of Asia was a was a very new, brand new expression of itself. And it was, I mean, well, one of the reasons why that that's true is you can see how quickly it was destroyed after the war. I mean, none of that rose again after 1945. That militarism bubble that argument that military power has a moral virtue was destroyed um, in, in at the end of the Second World War and thank goodness it was too. I mean it's actually really interesting because you you mentioned uh, Germany and um, fascinatingly enough um, I would imagine that the invasion of Manchuria really um, emboldened First, uh, Mussolini to invade Ethiopia, and then, of course, uh, Hitler yes. into the Sudetenland. And so, I mean, there was great outcry between the United States and and Great Britain. Uh, Lytton Commission coming in, and and mm. um, Japan leaving the League of Nations. But I I, I really believe that it, it emboldened the the two um, fascist powers in in, in Europe because yeah. of the yeah. lack of military response by yeah well i mean well, one thing that we that people just don't know is is the extent to which britain tried to appease japan by closing the burma road in may 1940 because britain was scared about the response from japan and you know uh, whilst whilst people castigate um chamberlain who was the prime minister in england before winston churchill for his appeasement of hitler at munich in 1938 no one castigates Winston Churchill for appeasing the Japanese in May 1940 when he was prime minister. You know, this is this is politics, but it's very, very important that people understand actually how um, not dealing with dictators, not dealing with these threats to um, uh, global polity and stability early on uh, can let, you know, can let the lion What's, what's the phrase, let the tiger out. And I think that's what we saw in the Far East look. And the other really important thing, of course, is that there was an enormous amount of collusion actually between Japan and Germany. Uh, and 
I, I wouldn't describe Japan as a fascist state. I, I don't think that's right. I mean, um, fascism is a is a particular ideology, but it was totalitarian in the sense that it was culturally very, very constrained, and it was militaristic. And they could see that Germany was becoming much more militaristic. It had a nasty fascist, racist um, streak to it, um, and they sought to learn from it. So after 1940, after the German invasion of the Low Countries in France, General Yamashita was sent with a um, uh, a group of other high-ranking Japanese officers to do a battlefield tour of France, and they learned a lot from it. We we know that throughout 1940, Yamashita came back and used much of the material that he gained the 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 Blitzkrieg uh, approach of the German Wehrmacht through France for their plans for Southeast Asia. So you're right. I mean, it's been described, I mean, I was reading one paper recently which described it as sort of the, the fascist approach to war, which is probably about right. It's not a well thought out approach. It's designed to uh, destroy sleeping democracies very swiftly in an overwhelming attack when they're not prepared for a response. Mm. Fortunately, for the West and for the history of the world, actually, the West, whilst it was sleeping in 1939 in Europe and 1941 in um, the Far East, had sufficient resources morally, intellectually, and economically to reach back, rebuild, and defeat the Japanese, and also defeat um, the fascist powers in, in Europe. And that's the other part of my story. It's really a story of defeat in the early years and then quite remarkable victory. I know we're running out of time, but it's really important to, I, mean, I do ask the question in the book, why was it that a, an empire, the British Empire, a, of which India was a very, very significant, significant part, was defeated so seriously in 1942? I mean, it was an absolute humiliation. But actually, it came back so quickly and almost easily, uh, such that by 1944, the Japanese could not stop uh, the, uh, the, the Allies at all. The, the overwhelming military superiority of the Allies, the Indian Army, the British and the Americans in 1944 was quite staggering. And, and all we really saw from Japan was the tragedy of sacrifice increasing numbers of young Japanese men thrown into their deaths for no political or strategic purpose whatsoever. And that in itself showed the enormity of the emptiness of militarism. The only thing militarism could give the young men and the people of Japan was death. Mm -hmm. And that's the point of their empire. That's why that bubble had to be pricked in 1945 and and, and it wasn't it marvelous that it was because you know militarism has no purpose in in in, in human politics. Mm. Anyway, that, I, I, the book is not a moral uh, morality tale, um, but you, you can you can read it as such. <laughs> Thank you guys so much. I'm jumping back in so we can start taking some a few questions. I did have one that I already started looking at when I was going through the question was. What made you decide to get into this historical route? What really pushed you in there? Was this like a, a, a childhood thing that you just were fond of? Was it something that happened later on? You know. Um, I, in terms of Burma, I was actually asked 30 years ago to, to write a course on, on the Burma campaign. I knew nothing about it. I sat down, looked at all the sources, laid it all out, realized I knew very, very little. And it's been a, and I then visited Burma and, and it's, and, and, I've been there many times since and in Deer as well. So it was a, a journey of discovery. And I think the really interesting thing for me is uh, someone described me actually on a lecture I was giving earlier today. They would said that I, I was a little bit like a stick of rock or in America, a stick of candy. You know, you cut me and there's Burma in the middle. And I think that's really where I am. I, it's, it's full of fascinating stories. Um, and every time I look at the subject, I find something new. Um, I deliberately set out for this book, not knowing what I'd find, but I said to myself, I want to challenge all my preconceptions. I mean, I, it's very, we all come with preconceptions, don't we? We were born with them. We were born into communities that have particular narratives about our past, 
I'd picked up all these things and I said, okay, how true are those? And I suddenly realized my, I think my big discovery for myself was this idea that India had no agency is completely false. It really is false. You know, we, India had a population of 300 million people. It was as live and as vibrant and as um, communicative and talkative. It had a very, very strong press uh, as we have today. And I think what historians need to do, and this is what I love doing, is giving agency, giving voice back to the people who I'm trying to interrogate. That's the, that's the really exciting thing about all of this. And Dr. Culver, what pushed you to go down this historical route? Um, I grew up with, uh, well, my mother's German, so I grew up with her stories of the war uh, when she was a, a child and just these really riveting tales of what it was like to live under an authoritarian regime. Um, and then, you know, the occupation. Interestingly, her part of Germany was occupied by the British. And um, my dad grew up during the Great Depression in the United States. And for him, living on the West Coast of the United States, right near San Diego, where there was a big naval base, it was a quite anxious, but also exciting time of time for him as a small boy. Um, and so I, I grew up hearing all of these, all of these stories. And um, I was also a English teacher in Japan uh, through the JET program. And, I was just really interested in how the students were learning about their own history. And what I noticed was the way it's taught in Japan is they reach all the way up to the Meiji period after doing thousands of years of Japanese history, but they don't really get into the war very much. Um, yeah. And there's at that time when I was teaching there, they only had a footnote for the Nanking massacre. And to me, that was really interesting. Uh, as um, a, a teacher of English, I also was teaching a story in English called um, A Mother's Lullaby, which was about the dropping of the atomic bomb. But it was completely taken out of context. Uh, there was no description of why the bomb was dropped, nor by whom, or what the context was. And so, <laughs> I thought that was really interesting, right? Because in fifth grade, they just like American students usually go to Washington DC to see the Holocaust Museum and that sobering stack of, of shoes, Japanese yeah. students go to Hiroshima. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, they, they are, I'm absolutely fascinated to hear this. I mean, when I go to Tokyo, I'm still amazed to see the number of, see how important the shrine is actually in Tokyo. Um, so the vestiges, for, certainly for old men, the vestiges of our militarism are still there. And the, the hope we have for the future is that young people will increasingly engage with their history and understand what happened. Um, I think that's a very powerful story, actually. Yeah, Yaskuni Shrine, interestingly enough, is right across the street from the National Showa Museum, which has a very different narrative. Um, yeah. It's kind of the peace education narrative that we were victims during the war, which yeah. unfortunately negates the other side of the story that the Japanese empire was also an aggressor in so many locations. Yeah. yeah. Well, when I first went to Japan in 2000 to interview veterans, I, uh, they were very polite to me and I learned a lot and it was a fabulous experience for me. But the one thing I walked away from at the end of these meetings was uh, the sense that they were not at all, um, 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 what's the word I want? That they, they were not, um, they, they were not apologetic mm. for the war, nor indeed for um, what they did and what their army did. Mm. And I, I remember asking one of them about the strategic aims of Japan and you know the difference in what their strategy was and what the men did on the ground and his answer was essentially well we were following orders and I laughed to myself because of course that's the standard beer mark excuse for atrocities in eastern Europe it's, it's if you look at humankind they come up with the same excuses and I, I left those particular meetings after about two weeks thinking you know these people haven't changed their mind we have to wait for that generation to leave for a new generation to have a a different view
And I think that's, um, it's very sad, but it's not surprising. But um, I, I think th there's one important point I make in my book, which is, I think it's important, which is that there is an argument that says that the war in the Far East wasn't particularly important. The Japanese were going to be defeated anyway. I, I, th that's not true. It was very important for Japan to have its army defeated in battle. Mm -hmm. And it happened in the Pacific campaigns, but actually it also happened on three occasions, most notably against the Indian 14th Army in India 1944, against the Indian 14th Army in Burma 1945, and against the Russians in Manchuria 1945 as well. So the, the Imperial Japanese Army had been defeated. That military bubble had been burst. And that's, that was really important for Emperor Hirohito in making his decision to call a stop to the war. And I think we often forget this. We often feel that it was simply the atomic bombs, but no, I'm convinced that certainly with that civil war that was raging in Tokyo at the time, when Hirohito finally made that decision, he asked himself, is there any, is there any strength left in this argument that militarism will save Japan? And he came to the conclusion correctly that there wasn't. It was a busted flush. And that's really important. And actually, I got the feeling when I was there in 2000 and subsequently that this is a really important part of the Japanese um, psychology, social psychology, which is that there is no evidence that war will ever achieve anything for us. And it doesn't represent our identity. It's not us. Yeah, it's, it's absolutely fascinating. Um, I think I hear an echo. Am I hearing an echo from the Zoom? No, I can hear you loud and clear. I... Okay, good. <laughs> sometimes uh, I'm on the outskirts of Tallahassee, so sometimes my internet access uh, has these interesting um, effects. But um, yeah, in uh, in my um, my U.S. East Asia course, we're reading Asada Sadao's book, and he talks about um, the twin shock theory of um, the um, atomic bombing of Hiroshima and the invasion of, of uh, Manchukuo by the Soviets. Yeah, but yeah. Um, your book makes a very compelling argument for that there's also the defeat in India that um, motivated his decision, that there's a third shock, right? For I think there's a third shock. I think that I think it's important. I, 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 I think the Manchuria shock is really important as well. But I think that I often ask my students, you know, what would have happened had the Japanese not been defeated in India? Uh, had they been allowed to march home with their rifles? We would have had something very similar to the stab in the back theory in, that we had in, in Germany, 1918, 1919, that actually the army hadn't been defeated. It was the Jews and it was the capitalists and it was all the communists. It, was, it wasn't the real Japanese. And I, I, so I think the defeat for the Japanese we just forget the atomic bombs. It's not, they're not part of this argument. Proper military defeat of the Japanese, which happened before the, the atomic bombs were dropped, was fundamental in making those decisions. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I think we've run out of time. Yes, I actually have one more question. It's kind of the best way I like to end off these um, conversation. If you can sell your book in one sentence, go uh oh gosh um a a new way of thinking about how people were important in bringing victory to the democracies in the second world war and giving a future to india and less so to burma but certainly india it's a, it's a new view of the war this is not a, a western centric view it's not a story of the war in the Far East from the from London or Washington. It's what happened and why it's important in particular to India and its view of the world, its view of its history. It's more than one sentence, so forgive me. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Robert, and thank you, Dr. Culver, for spending the time with me and going over Robert Lyman's A War of Empires. If you guys are interested in purchasing the books, please just call us at the bookstore or visit us online. And on that note, I hope everyone has a great night. Thank you very much. It's been a real pleasure to be here with you from London, and um, I wish you all the very best in Tallahassee 
Florida. Annika, it's been a real pleasure talking to you tonight as well. Thank you. Absolutely. Great to meet you. And uh, thank you for having me. Um, this has been a pleasure. It's good stuff. We need to meet up in the flesh sometime soon. <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> thank you very much. Have a great night. Bye-bye, everyone. <laughs>